that to you unless you would like to read them yourself. But, um, but yeah, and it's actually recording already. So why don't we wait a couple of minutes still because people, people filter in slowly. Uh, so I say, I mean, we could start at like, I don't know. So it's like exactly 12 or from, for you, nine. <laughs> uh, so I mean, we could do like three minutes after the hour or something if you'd like, because then that gives people plenty of time. Um, and again, thanks for doing this. I appreciate it. Um, Good to be here. It's, uh, I think this is also like one of the first times I've, I've actually like really participated in, in the, the seat track too. So it's like a little new for me as well. Um, I think that the last time I went to ICSI was maybe 12 years ago. Been a long time. <laughs> well, it's, it's all uh, mostly, it's, I think it's all, aside from the format, I mean, it's, it's similar to how it was. So it seems like Mark is not joining right off the top. So I mean, I'll, I'll usually he and I kind of do intros, but if he's not having trouble connecting or something, I'll just address him at the end. <laughs> Are you guys going back to the office nowadays, by the way? Uh, I mean, it's like the, mm -hmm. the conversation now. You're not in the office though, are you at yes. home, I guess? Um, about 30 minutes before this talk, one of my family members tested positive for COVID. So we oh. have had a last minute Perfect. game change plan this morning. Okay. <laughs> well, uh, I hope that nobody was exposed. Uh, Good luck with that. It seems like it's really going around lately. That's another, another, I don't know if you noticed everybody on the internet, like who went to Kai, they were, a lot of people got COVID at Kai. So now everybody for the in-person ICSI is a little concerned. Um, not everybody, but a lot of people are. So it's like, well, the yeah, that's people how these worry about things on the internet. <laughs> um, All right, if we have one moment, I'm going to refill my coffee mug here. Oh, Alrighty, so maybe uh, I can like just could, oh, are you going to share your screen? Um, no, uh, I'm not going to talk with slides. Cool. Yes, awesome. I like those. Those are better, in my opinion. Okay, uh, so I'll just quickly introduce you, and then we can get going. And the the this also just so you you know the this time slot whatever ends at one. It just means that other people are going to go somewhere else probably if they have a, another talk they want to catch. But it's not like somebody is coming up right after you or something. So if people have questions, they can hang around and ask questions if you have the time. Um, but you can also have a hard stop too. That's fine. <laughs> um, okay, so thank you for doing this once again, Adriana. This is Adriana Porterfeld. Uh, she works at Google. She, you're a, a director of engineering at Google. Right, uh, working on the the Chrome team, and and I think uh, the, the thing that one of the things that Adriana is pretty well known for is uh, helping HTTPS be like adopted, you know, like broadly. Uh, I mean, obviously she's, you know, in the driver's seat of that aspect of Chrome, um, so via Chrome. But um, this is sort of a thing that I think probably from Chrome spread everywhere else. So. That's a big deal, uh, and so you know, in general, she she tends to focus on um, 
you know, trying to make security uh, uh, and privacy, things like this, like more accessible uh, in particular, like you, uh, the, you're, you're the sort of like the community that you run with is like the soups community, right? Like the usable privacy and security folks. Um, and you've even like won awards from them. You've got like, like is it the test of time or uh, it's one of the, uh, what is it? It's the impact is the impact award, the soups impact award um, for Android permissions, right? All kinds of, all kinds of like, you know, the permissions that you're probably familiar with as just a user of computers right now. These are the things that Adriana has kind of focused on throughout her career. Um, and you are, you started life as a respo, started life, I mean, okay. You started, you started off kind of on an, on an academic path, right? You, you, you did your PhD at Berkeley and then you uh, joined Google and you, wanted to introduce more security to people who use Chrome, basically. It was like your your goal, right? And now you've moved up the ladder and have made all kinds of cool uh, security features happen for users. And uh, uh, I think that's like the the thing that you are most, and also you're very hilarious on the internet. So if anybody wants to like laugh at accidentally ordering like large numbers of, I don't know, fruit or something on the, on the internet or whatever, like <laughs> these are things that like your husband have done or whatever. So you're also hilarious. Um, but without further ado, please, um, I'm going to close my video. So it's all you, um, but I'm still here. So. So. Hi everyone. It's great to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Um, I'm Adriana. Um, I first worked at Google as a grad student intern in 2008. And I think the most memorable part of that summer, um, was that I got my first glimpse at a brand new desktop browser that they were building called Chrome. And it launched, launched that summer uh, with a comic book. I then you know, worked with the Chrome team a bit on some projects while a grad student. And I came back to Google full-time in 2012, fresh PhD in hand, ink still wet, right when Chrome was launching its first mobile versions. And I originally was a research scientist, um, but at some point switched to engineering. Chrome was still relatively small then when I joined, still had a lot of rough edges. Over these years, I've seen Chrome go from a small upstart browser with kind of a niche market to one of the world's largest consumer software products. And today I'd like to share what that journey has been like and share the different types of product and engineering challenges that we faced at different stages of that journey. All right, so let's roll back time. Let's start with 2008. Hopefully everyone here can remember 2008. The soundtrack of the year was never gonna give you up, never gonna let you down, i.e. was the dominant browser. The founding Chrome engineering team at the time was mostly a mix of experienced browser engineers and academic security researchers. And their, their, their dream, their, their guiding principle as they built this new browser was to build a shiny new browser for themselves, built on, based on what they wanted out of a browser. What we call the four S's, security, speed, simplicity, and stability. Now, maybe I'm biased because I started my career or perhaps, you know, uh, the way Heather tells my story, like my life as a baby, as a security researcher. But uh, despite that bias, I think the most interesting engineering challenge that they faced in this era were how to build a more secure browser architecture. Um, existing browsers, um, i.e. in Firefox at the time, had two big problems. The first was that websites were running in the same processes as each other. Um, and also sort of high privileged parts of the browser and high risk parts of the browser were also running in shared processes. Uh, and actually, I'm going to tell you this part of the story by quoting a paper. Uh, isolating Web Programs in Modern Browser and Architectures by Charlie Rice and Steve Gribble from UW from 2009. 2009. Quote, today's publishers are deploying web pages that act more like programs than simple documents. And these programs are growing in complexity and demand for resources. Remember, this is 2008, 2009. Most websites at this point are not web apps. They're kind of like for the most part, sort of static pages you read, maybe you know, I have a few sections you click can click on. They're not, it was new at the time that web pages were becoming kind of rich and full feature. Current web browser architectures, on the other hand, are still designed primarily for rendering basic pages. 
in that they do not provide sufficient isolation between concurrently executing programs. As a result, computing programs within the browser encounter many types of inter interference that affect their fault tolerance, memory management, and performance. Surprisingly, web browsers do not yet have a program abstraction that can be easily isolated. Neither pages nor origins have appropriate isolation boundaries because some groups of pages, even those from different origins, can interact with each other within the browser. Now, from the very beginning, an architectural goal of building Chrome was to try to isolate different parts of, of the browser from itself so that the parts of the browser closest to websites were the least privileged and only inter interacted by well-defined IPC channels with more privileged parts of the browser. And also, as that paper was alluding to, different web principles were isolated from each other. And over the years, you know, over the last, I guess, uh, 12 years since that paper was written, um, the browser has uh, increased the sophistication and hardness of the isolation primitives until the point today where we have a truly multi-process uh, desktop browser and with different websites that don't have to share processes. Now, the reason why I was quoting from a paper here, instead of just telling it totally my own words, was because I wanted to drive home the point that the idea of a multi-process browser came out of academic research. Um, Charlie Rice and Adam Barth were among the most prolific and well-known web security researchers at the time as students and postdocs. And then they joined the early Chrome team right at, kind of at the beginning of, of Chrome's creation and brought their ideas with them. And, um, you know, I think Charlie in particular had this audacious research vision that, you know, took maybe 10 years of engineering to fully complete. All right, so I promised that there are two problems though. The first one that I was just talking about is separation of principles. The second one was that extensions and add-ons as they existed at the time in other browsers were a big mess. Um, IE add-ons were often malicious and they could take over your whole computer pretty readily. Um, Firefox extensions were better, but still a constant source of pain. A major challenge was that a vulnerability in a popular Firefox extension could mean a whole browser exploit. And unfortunately, you know, extensions were often vulnerable. You know, they're not written with the same amount of care as the rest of the browser. Uh, Chrome therefore launched a new extension model with two key parts. The first was that extensions run with a restricted set of privileges, and they have to ask for user permission to go beyond that. Second, extensions were split into two parts. The parts that interact with the website has to interact with the more privileged part of the extension with special privileges through a narrow, in narrow interface, giving um, a layer of defense. Now, again, this was primarily viewed as an engineering problem that was heavily influenced by academic research. Uh, Adam Barth worked on this as he was finishing up his postdoc and then as a new Google employee. And I helped him out on the extension model while I was still a grad student at Berkeley. Uh, in fact, you can read a paper if you want to learn more about this, uh, the origin of the Chrome extension model. It's called Protecting Browsers from Extension Vulnerabilities. Um, you know, an, an, an additional thing that was new about Chrome at the time that seems like total table stakes now is that Chrome was also the first browser to ship on a relatively short release schedule every six weeks instead of once a year. Um, most of Google was shipping websites that released weekly or even daily or maybe multiple times a day. So the engineers who built Chrome thought six weeks would be a very reasonable cadence for launching a browser. And today we release every four weeks. Today, this sounds slow, by the way, releasing every four weeks, but at the time, it was sort of a big deal to have a browser that would be auto-updating on this kind of rapid cadence. So if I had to characterize the early day engineering challenges that Chrome had, I'd say that they were mostly technical problems. They were problems that we could reason about from first principles as engineers or by observing how software worked. We didn't really have to understand much about the user base or developers beyond what we knew from our own intuition as us as users, us as developers. And another thing that characterized this early time period was that the team was very influenced by ideas from academic researchers who joined industry to build those ideas out. And at the time, Google was like, hey, yeah, sure, we'll, we'll hire you to build that crazy thing that sounds really hard to do. Sure, why not? And I'm, I'm glad they, didn't, they did that or I wouldn't be here today. All right, so let's let's move on now to the early 2010s. The early 2010s were the start of the mobile era. Early adopters had had smartphones for a few years by then in the early 2010s, 
but lots of other people were getting uh, phones for the first time or maybe even internet access for the first time via a smartphone. And even among the early adopters, people didn't use their phones all day the way that they do today. Phones were still a bit clumsy and kludgy, kind of going through teenage growing pains. And in this era, Chrome launched on Android and iOS in June 20, 2012. Two challenges characterized this era. And the first was, how do you turn a desktop browser into a mobile browser? I mean that technically speaking, how do you do it? You've got more memory constraints. You might not be able to have as many processes. Um, in the case of iOS, uh, there were restrictions on what we could ship as a browser by Apple. Lots of questions around how to actually build a browser. But how do you turn a desktop browser into a mobile browser is also a product problem. You have a tiny screen. You can't see the whole URL. How do you take this big screen browser concept and squish it into a tiny little screen? As an aside, I don't think we've solved this question yet, to be honest. You'll see that Chrome Mobile periodically changes how and where you switch between tabs, or you know, we change around how what you what type of content is on the new tab page, or we change what the browser does when you tap on the icon to first open it. And the reason we're changing these, why this is something you, you still see evolving today, is because Chrome is still trying to adapt, in my opinion, to the, the new mobile era and shed the last vestiges of originally coming from a desktop browser mindset. How do you turn a desktop browser into a mobile browser? There's also the web content itself. Websites are sometimes unreadable or unusable on small phones, you know. Um, tiny text, weird layout that doesn't resize, um, buttons that you can't actually press with your finger. You know, th these problems aren't too common these days, at least probably not in the um, countries that likely you, you hear this audience is using the web on because most web developers now know about responsive design, but they didn't always design that way. So at the time as, you know, the team is thinking about how to launch a mobile browser, um, you know, uh, we were building features into the browser to resize text, change the layout, simplify pages, and so on to make websites usable. There's also an outreach aspect of this, reaching out to developers to try to get them to follow best practices for mobile devices, telling people, hey, here's what you should be doing. Please do this. Please do this. Please make your website work on mobile. Uh, really, though, it just eventually became obvious to the majority of web developers that their traffic was coming on smartphones, so they fixed their websites to work better on phones. Now, in your free time, after trying to figure out how to turn a desktop browser into a mobile browser, you could also worry about challenge number two that characterizes this era. How do we compete with apps? The web was built to be this super safe place where you could visit a website and then leave it like it never happened. Wouldn't be rummaging around in your contacts or deleting your documents folder by accident or whatever. So this model is safe, but also limiting. Mobile apps, in contrast, were like somewhere in between. They're not as privileged as desktop executables that could like burn the whole thing down, but they were more privileged and therefore more powerful than apps uh, than, than websites. So we face this tension between offering websites richer APIs so that they could stay relevant, so that they could you know compete with with apps but also sticking to the implied promise of safety that we offer to users whenever they load a web page. And navigating this tension often involved asking users what they wanted to do or informing them about the privileges that the website uh, wanted to have. Now, one thing you should notice is that these problems that I'm talking about in this era are largely about people. They're, they're technical problems, sure, but they're also very much about what end users want what people expect, what makes software usable, and how developers behave. And right around this time, mid-2010s, we now get to the rise of India. According to Statista, only 2% of Indians had smartphones in 2010. By 2016, it was 20%. Do you know what 20% of 1.4 billion is? It's a lot. 280 million people. For comparison, the US in 2016 had 192 million smartphone users. 
a lot more people in India using the internet than the United States. And of course, we could see that trend in India going up much faster than in the United States, just because the kind of the market opportunity, there are a lot more people in India to begin adopting smartphones than the United States. Now, in his earliest days, the Chrome product team built a browser for themselves as both end users and as web developers. That meant pretty much they were building for knowledge workers with great educations. They're building for people working in offices, maybe using their laptops all day, you know, kind of a smartphone just as a second accessory. Uh, people who are living in California who spoke English. Now, when the problems you start facing, like the ones I was just talking about, what you expect out of a mobile browser, how you expect a mobile browser to work, um, when those problems are about people and the people that you're trying to reason about aren't necessarily like you, they have different constraints, they have different expectations, you're going to start running into trouble unless you can expand your worldview pretty fast. Um, and there were some very important ways that Indians were different from the Californian Chrome product team in the mid 2010s, by the way, which did include a number of people who had immigrated from India, but you know, they themselves were living in California and you know, in many ways showed the characteristics of Californians. So like thinking about just people in California versus kind of the, the large group of um, smartphone users in India, there were some pretty important differences. <laughs> the first is that they weren't using Chrome. They were using another browser called UC Browser, um, you know, which immediately made it pretty clear that we weren't serving their needs. UC Browser was built by or is built by a Chinese company, and it was, uh, you know, built with India as a market in mind. Second, a lot of these people were coming online for the first time with phones. They weren't coming from a desktop world. They didn't have preconceived notions about how desktop so software worked. Concepts like tabs, windows, URLs, file navigation weren't concepts they already had. Now, of course, this isn't true. India is a huge and very diverse country. There are a lot of knowledge workers, software engineers in India. But thinking about the large group of people, tens of millions of people uh, who are just coming online for the first time in India, this was a characteristic of that particular group. And third, there are many Indians who speak little to no English. And in that era, their phones likely were set to English for a variety of reasons about, um, you know, what software packs were, were offered on phones to, um, you know, sometimes stores would set them up for people and would set the language to English and not ask them, you know, what language they wanted their phone to be in. And they wouldn't know how to change it because once the phone is in the wrong language, it's pretty hard to change it to the right one. So, you know, lots of people, tens of millions of people stuck using our English UI and getting English websites without necessarily actually really comfortably or fluently reading English. And fourth, data was very expensive and slow relative to a middle class Indian's income. This has changed. Data has gotten a lot less expensive in India. But at the time, people were frequently running out of data because it was so expensive. And this matters when you're thinking about like, how big can my browser binary be? How often will people be willing to download that big binary to update? Our websites too big and too slow. Um, our, you know, our, our competitors like UC Browser were doing a much better job at saving people data. And this is the era when Chrome really started using user research and data science to drive product decisions. I went to India along with a lot of my colleagues. We spoke to people to understand how they use our product, what they wanted out of our product. And our excellent user research team helped us get insight into people's lived experiences and problems with our software. Engineers did great technical work in response to these problems, but in my memory, this time period was defined by the shift towards user research and data science. And also this is the, this is the time period when we really started building out those functions. Um, you know, before, before then we didn't have a data science team. Um, you know, this is when we realized we needed to start building that muscle. We need to start building up a data science team. Now today, Chrome is a huge browser. Um, billions of active Chrome installs that map to billions of people around the world are, are running every moment, every month, every day. 
And most of the challenges that I think about today stem from the challenges of that scale. So I'm going to share three of those challenges that we're struggling with right now. The first is, how do we understand our users? Our user population is so incredibly diverse, you know, ranging from an elderly person living a nomadic lifestyle in a desert to a teenage DJ in Manhattan who grew up with a smartphone in her hands. How do you build one product for all of these people? How do you understand what they all want and need? Now, as I alluded to, this is a user research and data science problem. So we've built up teams that try to help product managers and engineers make sense of the sheer scale and diversity of the user population. I don't think that there are many products out there that operate at this scale. Uh, maybe Google search, YouTube, Facebook, Windows, the Office Suite. There aren't that many though, which means that sometimes it feels like we're in uncharted territory. Like there isn't a best practices guide you can go read about what, what to do when you're in this position. And it kind of messes with your head. It's, it's, it's immensely hard to think about. Um, and it's also an engineering problem. The type of data we work with is unique, which means that we build most of our own tools in-house. So Chrome captures metrics as aggregated and pseudonymously, pseudonymously keyed histograms. This means that uh, for users with metrics reporting enabled, our data science team can say things like, an average page load in India on Android takes X milliseconds. Um, or if you launch two versions of your UI, one in red and one in green, we know that people tend to click on the red one more. So maybe we should make this button red. What makes it unique are a few things. Uh, there are a lot of clients reporting metrics. Um, some of the clients that are sending us data are adversarial or broken in some bizarre way and send, sending us garbage data. And we key that data by an identifier that isn't connected to anything else, like it isn't connected to your Google account, for example. As a result, we've built all of our own data processing and visualization tools, our own A-B testing infrastructure, and so on. We are admittedly not state of the art um, because this is a secondary product that we're building for ourselves to consume. We're not going to build like the world's absolute best data visualization product just for our own internal purposes. Um, we wanna spend most of our inch time focused on shipping Chrome, not on building a product that's only used by Chrome team members. But at the same time, it still has to be good enough because you know, it's key to, our team, to the Chrome team's ability to make decisions and to operate. So we're kind of you know, faced with this resourcing or investment decision of trying to understand like, okay, what's good enough. What this means is that there are data visualization techniques that you'll see in academia, that you see in textbooks that honestly we're not using. Um, instead, we're trying to figure out like, what's our best bang for buck? Like, what can we implement that gets us what we need to, to, to do, but that isn't going to cost us a lot to implement. A second and related problem is how we make trade-offs for different user groups. Like, all right, we got this data, we can see okay, this group of people likes this, this group of people like this, how do we make trade-offs? There's no such thing as software that works for everyone. Um, perfectly usable software that works for everyone all the time is a good goal. It's what we would like to build, but it doesn't exist. Um, for example, really engaged web developers want us to push the envelope for them they want new web APIs, new CSS features, new, new, new. They want their websites, you know, to, to always be like on the cutting edge using the shiniest thing. They want to build creative, profitable, cool web applications. Contrast, there are also people who haven't updated their website in 20 years and they really don't want to. And if we break their website, their small furniture shop in Paris won't have a storefront, won't be able to sell, will go out of business. Like, you know, go away, stop changing things, please don't break my website. Um, so, you know, how, how, how do we reconcile these, these two very different needs? Um, another example is some tech savvy people don't like things explained to them. They don't like things to be simplified. They don't want to feel like they're being patronized. 
But on the flip side, there are still quite a lot of people who are uncomfortable using smartphones, uncomfortable using websites, wondering what the heck all those icons are. And we have to figure out how to build a product that can work for both groups. And, and something that, that I particularly struggle with is the kind of um, tech savvy group, you know, that's uh, tends to be very vocal and, um, and it can be hard to get, you know, like we get most of our ready feedback, you know, the people who reach out to me on Twitter or send an email or file feedback saying that they don't like something tend to come from a relatively small group of the population. And so it can be really tempting to kind of anchor on their needs and what they're asking for and what they're saying they don't like. But at the same time, there's kind of this much larger group of slightly confused people who represent like a much larger group of the population and they're not directly reaching out. They're kind of just like ugh, quietly frustrated and thinking it's their fault. Like, oh, it's my fault. I can't use this software, which by the way, it's not. It's our fault for not having built software that works for you. So try, trying to reason through that tension. And the third challenge is uh, how do we keep innovating when we have the weight of responsibility on our shoulders? A bug in Chrome, for example, might mean a bug in WebView on Android, which I don't know, many, most, all Android apps use. So let's imagine we accidentally introduce a, a crash into WebView by making a change in Chrome. Let's say we catch it. We pause the rollout, you know, we're only at like 10% or something. That still might mean hundreds of millions of people can't use apps on their phone. And, you know, some of those people might not be able to earn income that day, might not be able to finish their coursework on time, might not be able to get where they need to go. And how do you do anything? Like, how do you, how do you push anything live? when you know that a small change can have by accident this, this impact. And you know, the answer is perhaps obviously an emphasis on testing, on safeguards and on process. We care a lot about testing these days. Um, you know, testing for us is, is a shared responsibility. We do have a, a test team um, that does QA, but also it is responsibility of every engineer to be building tests for their code and to both automate a test and also, you know, to be like having, I have a bunch of, a bunch of devices here at my desk, um, you know, to be testing themselves. And when things go wrong, we do retrospectives to understand it and to try to stop it from happening again. We have processes in place to review engineering plans, launch metrics, and so on. The, the safeguards are you know, meant to stop bugs and, and issues from shipping. But it's a tricky balance to make because we, we want to fulfill this responsibility of providing a reliable browser, reliable software. You know, Chrome is a, a tool, something people depend on, um, while still shipping a modern and compelling product. And there is such a thing as too much caution or too much of an accumulation of uh, process that can make the execution velocity, that can make the act of engineering painful, frustrating, slow, and maybe not even in a way that is getting you the benefits that you want. So figuring this out, getting this balance right is a big part of my job right now. By the way, a quick plug, if any of you are interested in understanding users at scale, if any of you are interested in figuring out how we can reason about testing and execution velocity and solve these trippy problems, uh, we are hiring data scientists, data engineers, product analysts, and user researchers. Um, our data team is a very PhD heavy team that brings analytical and statistical rigor to an engineering team. So please reach out to me at felt at google.com. Okay, back to the scheduled show. So, you know, I, I sort of just talked about uh, challenges over the last, uh, you know, last few years since, since 2008. And I've also had an opportunity to, through that time to, to kind of, you know, having been a researcher myself uh, and now an engineer, to think about some things that 
researchers, particularly academic researchers, do and don't do really well compared to engineering teams. And I wanted to share that. So I'll start with three things that from, yeah, this is just my opinion, <laughs> not speaking on behalf of all of Google, just my opinion as to three things that it seems to me like academic research doesn't do well. The first is that I see a lot of academic work that centers US conditions in terms of user studies, assumptions about network conditions, assumptions about the education background and language that developers have, and so on. The US is, an, is a medium-sized country, but it's one of many. It's, you know, maybe not as special as US research, researchers think. It just happens to be the base of a lot of research, and it's easy to, to, to talk and think about what's, what's familiar. But from my perspective, you know, like <laughs> when I read something that's just about the United States, you know, or that's specific to the United States, I kind of don't know what to make of it because, you know, the majority of our user base is not in the United States. Another thing is that, you know, I myself as a researcher, uh, you know, as a grad student, uh, had this really naive idea about how knowledge transfer happens between research and engineering. And I've seen lots of other people make the same mistake. So I thought I would tell you all today so that you don't all maybe make the same mistake that, that I did. I thought that I would just send a paper to someone or present it to them and I would convince them of my genius idea and then they would go implement it. Yeah, okay. So like, yes, this has happened to Cynthia Dwork. You're probably not Cynthia Dwork, although if you are, I am incredibly honored that you're listening to this. But assuming you're not, you know, sure, people are going to listen to you and maybe digest it and file it away somewhere. And maybe it'll come back later to their minds when they're solving a problem or, or not, you know. Okay, maybe you'll be lucky. Maybe someone will be super excited about your work. And this thing that I said doesn't happen will happen. But it's not a common path. Usually people don't read a paper and go, oh yeah, I should go implement that. Instead, most knowledge transfer at Google is actually people transfer. What happens is that Google hires people from the research community into research teams. And then they spend the next several years of their career turning their research into an actual product. This is what Adam Barth and Charles Rice did with their web security ideas. Um, it's what I, I did in my first few years on the Chrome team. And so in these cases, it's not like the researchers are from outside convincing the engineers to do something. It's more like the researchers became the engineers. And I think the third thing that's tricky for researchers to get right is knowing what costs matter. Like what's expensive or hard to do? What, what trade-offs are worth it? Um, you know, sometimes people send me papers to read or review and I'm like, we would never in a million years do that. Like, yes, you say this only breaks, you know, like 5% of the websites you tested it on, but that's a lot, <laughs> like 5% is, and, you know, 5% of websites is a lot of websites. And like, you know, okay, maybe this will only break things for 2% of people. How many millions, tens of millions of people is that? Um, now, this is not really the fault of academia, of course. Um, it's a systemic problem. Like, how could you possibly know? It requires all the context of actually being in the organization to see what's valued. And I think this is where close working partnerships between industry and academia can really shine because it allows the two groups to kind of uh, create a shared understanding of priorities and context. So the most successful collaborations that I've seen have been ones where, you know, um, you know, engineers and outside researchers are able to kind of over time build a relationship, kind of talk back and forth about this is the problem that's on my mind and this is why it's hard for us to solve. And, uh, you know, that kind of gives the, the research team a sense as to what might, what might be realistic, what could be useful, what could be adopted. Now on the flip side, there are certainly things that researchers do better than Google. And uh, I wanted to, to share my perspective on a few of those. I think one really valuable thing that I appreciate is understanding niche communities. Now, 
remember a moment ago when I said that I don't get a ton of value out of academic work that's about like network patterns of US college students because you know it's so narrow and specific to the US. But I do get a ton of value about research on kind of understudied or underserved niche communities. Like I, you know, I've seen academic papers on fascinating topics like what technology do domestic violence survivors need? What do journalists need? What do women in Saudi Arabia do for technology? And what, what are, you know, is technology serving them well? How do the newest programmers who maybe don't even think of themselves as programmers yet uh, learn new programming languages? I learned so much from reading these and I tuck the lessons away and, you know, I, I pull them out when, when they're relevant or when they matter. And uh, because Google has to do everything at scale, we rarely get to do this type of in-depth research and I really value and treasure it. And, you know, I often see like these types of papers sent around between my colleagues. Another thing that researchers do really well is breaking our stuff. Uh, yes, of course, you know, we have, we try to break our own stuff too, but I love reading paper and works that tells us what we're doing wrong because it lets us fix it. Um, and I, I also think that a, a very valuable thing that the research community can do or does do is discussing the ethics of technology. Um, I asked a colleague, Chris, Chris Thompson, what he thinks the most influ influential papers are. And he listed Phil Rogaway's The Moral Character of Cryptographic Work. I was like, yes, look, I love that paper. Uh, I think about ethics all the time and it's something I talk about with my colleagues but it isn't something that I can comfortably discuss in public. Like, I don't want to, you know, read some headline like Google director Adriana Porterfell says she would drive a trolley over a helpless person. Um, but these discussions are something that researchers do well, that I learn from, that I enjoy listening to. And I think they're also really important because technological process has key social implications and these conversations have to be had. Thank you all for listening to me today. I hope I've been able to give you a glimpse into what it's like to work on and run Chrome across the years along our journey from the little browser who could to the big browser who does. Um, if any of you know how to solve our problems, please come tell me or even better, come work with me. And I would love to take questions. Yep. I've already got one question. You wanna just go ahead and read it out loud and answer it? Sure. Uh, now that you have moved from being a researcher to a global engineer, do you have any insights regarding what basic science is required as a basic as a basis for software engineering practice in addition to ethics discussions? Um, a very, very common thing for an engineer to do on Chrome and actually on most products at Google is run A-B tests. Like even though know, we have um, data scientists, you know, engineers does often design and run their own A-B tests, which requires sort of a basic scientific understanding of how to design and run an experiment. Um, you know, this is something that is, is very widely done. At least when I went to school, it wasn't something that was covered in classes, um, you know, for undergrads. And it wasn't something I learned to do until a graduate student. I hope that more undergrads are, are learning this today. Seem you could be doing, you know, a more even job, <laughs> but it's not super even <laughs> for the record. Like it's not a solved problem yet. Hi, can I ask a question, Heather? Go for it. Yeah, it's easier than, than typing. Uh, thank you so much, Adriana. Um, it's been one of the most enjoyable talks i ever listened i have to say how well you spoke without the slides but you gave us so many insights into large-scale engineering so humbly from someone who, who's trying to to do this well and i have so many quotes and a couple i tweeted because um one of the things that stayed with me you said how do we innovate how do we continue to innovate when we have the weight of responsibility on your shoulders because when you mess it up or you don't pay attention to the end users who 
for whom for whom just availability or even access to your to your to your uh, browser was was essential for their daily lives, right? To me, that's actually innovation as well. Um, solving a community, uh, someone's need on a daily basis is innovation in itself. You don't have to always, I think, be be advancing, you know, and, and going for for the most um, fascinating and eye catching innovation, right? Um, I also really liked uh, your call for us to study a large end user elicitation and reconciliation of different needs and perspectives. And I study requirements engineering, and that's I think that's one of the biggest challenge. How, how do we how do we tackle into that large user base? Um, and maybe I'll talk to you if we can come up with some more concrete research plans from here. But anyway, thank you, thank you so much. I really enjoyed it. Um, how, how you how you took us through this journey? Thank you so much. Thanks for the feedback, thank and I would love to chat. Got a question from Stephen Fraser in the chat. Thank you, Daniel. Interested to know your observations on how university curricula can be improved to educate students and researchers the challenges of scale. Oh, that's an interesting question. Um, I mentioned earlier A-B testing, which is something that I think uh, does not seem to be a skill that most new grads that we're hiring have to, to begin with when they start. Um, you know, I think I mentioned ethics earlier. Um, I personally had an opportunity at the University of Virginia to take some undergraduate engineering ethics classes that I thought were extremely valuable. I still like to this day think about them. Um, and I think that uh, talking about, first of all, like having these classes is important. And second of all, talking about scale and sort of the, the implications that um, of building software for large numbers of people that people depend on I think is a great topic for that. Um, also, I remember, you know, like when I took uh, at Berkeley, I took these wonderful design classes on how to design. And, you know, you learn about like, oh, you pick a specific, you have a specific user profile in mind and you build for them, which is what you do when you are building a product that is targeted at a specific like a new product, like you're building it for the specific user profile or a small group of user profiles. Um, that approach does not work when you're like, oh, most of the planet is my user demographic. I don't know. Like, <laughs> um, we've struggled to try to figure out how to adapt those those well known sort of design practices to uh, a larger scale setting. I don't know if that's something you have to teach or not, though, because it is sort of unique to a small number of products. Like, there aren't a ton of products that um, are at, at at scale this large, so. I can maybe understand why, why it's not being taught. Um, Tushar, go for it. Okay. Now I can ask, uh, I was giving you options to collect the uh, Anyway, thank you, first of all. It was very, very insightful talk. It gives us a lot of um, not only thoughts, but also many ideas of how and what goes behind the scene when we see a Chrome browser, and especially on, on the mobile. So thank you for that. And, and especially the Indian context, I can totally relate to that. I, in my own house, in my back, back, it, back there in India, there are four different types of users. So I can make sense of that, what you said. Uh, well, the question is about uh, uh, one of the things that you mentioned that uh, you, uh, in which you said that uh, you are getting feedback from one of the classes of users very frequently, but a large uh, number of users were actually not responding or, or not providing the feedback at the same rate. Um, so, so there is a non-response bias essentially. So how i mean th that would be the interesting thing to understand and in fact you touched upon that but uh, it, it would be great if you can elaborate a little bit more how you can uh, combine or or get or or consider the the inputs or or or, or the user scenario or whatever i mean from the people who are actually not really responding 
uh, and and not really giving weight too much to the people who are actually responding. Um, thanks, thanks for asking. That's an interesting question. I think um, we have a few different you know channels of of hearing from people. Um, you know, one is the um, metrics platform that I talked about. We can look at what people do. Of course, for people who are are uh, have metrics reporting enabled, but that tells us kind of at a very aggregated level, like what people click on and tells us what they do, not why. Um, then we have the user research team who goes out and they try to, you know, find groups of people to run run surveys on, to ask questions on, do in-person interviews with. Um, and there they're thoughtful and they're participant, you know, they'll have kind of a target of like, oh, you know, we want to talk to people in this city, or we want to talk to people in that city, and maybe not even just like of this type of age or this type of occupation. That, that that sort of thing in order to to proactively seek feedback and you know those are usually paid research participants then there's feedback you know people do use like the actual feedback function in the browser sometimes like after your browser crashes you have an opportunity to get feedback we do look at those and also help forums um and then there's sort of like the pr slash twitter type feedback which tends to be very very visible um, often, you know, it's like brought directly to the engineering team. So that's kind of the, I think, where you sort of get that sample bias. And if you anchor on it too much, you can get this warped perspective. So, you know, I, I think it is important to hear that feedback, but you also have to make sure we're looking at, you know, the other, other three sources. Thank you very much. I actually have a question. So, uh, you didn't directly say it, but it just, it's a figure of a kind of research that involves actually asking people the whys. You, you just kind of alluded to it uh, in your previous answer. Like we can see these like, you know, large scales sort of like uh, in mass metrics of, okay, people, what people are clicking on, but we don't know why, right? And so how do you figure that out? Well, you go actually ask people. Um, and I mean, you know, this, this can be done obviously on a broader scale, not just like, you know, only fine-tuning a product but like also knowing whether or not like a, a product is developing the right direction you know <laughs> you know ethically right it, it, stuff like that um and it, you know you, you also mentioned that um stuff like ethics research and, and whatnot is also very interesting to most people on your team but there's always there's also this issue of like nobody wanting to fund it or not enough people doing it and i'm just wondering like i i know that you are not like you know the boss of the universe or anything um, but like, <laughs> where who sh who should be like the ones, uh, not just funding, but like doing that kind of research? Because it seems like universities try to do it, but it's like one person here, one person there, you know. And companies don't typically want to spend, you know, money on that because there's all kinds of other sort of like more pressing, shorter term engineering things that have to be done. So like, who should do that? Is my is my question. This is just like a general. What do you think? Yeah, I mean, we definitely have much more insight into the what than the why. And so I very much value papers that look at the why. Um, I do think that there is a research community around this. You know, the folks at the folks at Kai, for example, like, you know, this, this is sort of their, their bread and butter research is trying to understand, uh, understand people. Um, you know, there are also conferences like IMC where people, you know, are taking a measurement approach. And so, you know, they're maybe still looking at the bit of the what, but they're trying to figure out the why from it. Um, I mean, Google does try to fund this this work. You know, we as we give out grants, uh, you know, some of it does go go to this type of work. Um, I think I know this is kind of like a like a way beyond your <laughs> your wheelhouse kind of question. It's like who should fund humanities qualitative stuff is. I mean, is I guess the question. I mean, not necessarily. Hey, Google, can you pay for it? But like, also, like, I mean, Google needs it, right? Like, but so does everybody else. I and mean, it's just would be. It, it seems like it, it would. All, uh, I mean, not just you guys, but literally everybody insights about like what technology is doing to us. And I just kind of, I know that Kai, uh, Kai does do like do like a lot of more user studies, obviously, because they're interested in the human aspect of things. But sort of like qualitative qualitative work is something that I don't see so much of. Something that I think like is kind of sometimes I see technical people doing themselves a disservice by drawing a line between like, oh, I do engineering work or I do engineering research. I don't do people research. Like, 
that's humanities. It's a separate thing. I don't think it's a separate thing. I, I would love if like people didn't draw a line between that and that kind of a standard, you know, systems or engineering researchers um, toolkit would include both, you know, building systems, evaluating systems, and also evaluating systems as they interact with people. Um, I don't think that we should necessarily be drawing a genre line. And I will say that there is, I experienced some prestige gap when I was in academia between like, oh, you're doing like the soft work. Um, and I, and the reality is like that type of work drives a lot of the decision making behind what is built. And you need both hats and often you need people with both skill sets. So because, you know, you need to both think about like, what are the people constraints and how do we meet them? And if those are two totally separate groups, like never shall they meet. So I would love if more researchers kind of like weren't drawing that distinction and were instead just saying like, oh, this is just research. I think you hit the nail on the head by calling it like the prestige gap, because I think that's, I think that, I mean, that's, I don't know. I obviously really don't know truly these things. Cause this is not my area, but like, it seems like that this is a strong factor that like drives people more technical in some cases because of this perceived prestige, prestige gap. Uh, anyway, thanks for mentioning that. Cause that, that makes it make sense to me. Could you share more about your experience with knowledge sharing and tech transfer between people transfer? Um, I think, 99% of it has been people transfer. Um, I don't see this happening very often outside of people transfer. There are exceptions, right? Like the reason I mentioned Cynthia, Cynthia Dork, I think um, she's the author of the original differential privacy paper, if I'm remembering correctly. Um, and you know, like differential privacy is something that has been hugely impactful across industry, right? So there are ideas that, you know, people, pitch and then people get excited about them and they try to implement them. Maybe they try over and over and over again to implement them until they can figure out how to get it right because the idea is so appealing that you know even if the first try doesn't work, they're willing to keep at it because the thing it promises is so appealing. But I, I see that happen very infrequently. Um, it's at least my experience has been almost entirely people transfer. Um, textbooks, I think maybe are the exception like if there's kind of work that's gone into a textbook, like for example, when I was on the security team, I had the handbook of warnings as kind of a textbook that I and other folks referenced on the team. That was sort of, you know, just like a, a it's a it's a broad description of how warning design in products, it actually, I don't even think covered computers at all, but like in physical products, like how you design, you know, poison warnings, things like that. Um, that was something that we looked at, but it wasn't kind of one individual research study. It was just like, this is how the field of warnings works. So we, I mean, we have a couple more minutes for more questions. Um, and also, and I'll, you know, we're also kind of running up against the, the one o'clock uh, boundary, which we have a bunch of people are going to meet, but get your questions in before, before we run out of time. Can I jump in or you have any other question in mind, uh, Heather? Um, I liked your uh, also comment at Adriana about humanities is not separate than engineering. And, at ICSI, we have seen uh, recognition of qualitative work, of studying of social aspects in how software development happens, especially in large scale teams, right? For, for example, uh, you know, speaking about privacy and security, there's a lot of uh, studies of um, app reviews and how people express concerns about privacy, <clears throat> which also has implications to how organizations can listen to the crowd, right, and, and see uh, the, con the perceived concerns and, you know, regardless of the policies they have. Um, so I, it's, I'm very, very hopeful that this integration of humanities and engineering will continue to, to be seen at, at our conference. And hopefully some days those papers will make it into more, you know, meaningfully to, to Google. <laughs> so thank you for that call. Lionel Brian, who also got the uh, Distinguished Research Award this morning, made the same call of integrating those who study human behavior and social aspects of software development and the engineering of the software. Doing it at large scale is a challenge though. 
Thank you again. I agree with you, Danielle. Just for like a plus one. <laughs>Well, thank you so much to everyone for, for joining me this morning and having this conversation. Um, I'm not super hard to find online. Felt, my last name, at google.com. Um, always happy to uh, follow up chat, hear any thoughts you might have after the talk.